only have so much time. And in your day, your employees have only so much time. What if they're doing a physical task like sorting things or moving items from one place to another? Or both, <laughs> sorting and then moving. These things can be analyzed by something called a time and motion study. There was a fellow named Frederick Winslow Taylor. He was around about a hundred years ago, from 1856 to 1915. He was an American mechanical engineer. That's his starting point. And engineers like breaking things up into parts and seeing what's there. A lot of people think that he's the father of something called scientific management, which was just becoming popular at the time, including in the military. Up until then, you know, hey, we'll line the guys up. They'll have rifles. They're not very good shots overall. We know what their range is going to be. In fact, in the Napoleonic era, they didn't even teach you to aim. I want you to think about this. It was just point the weapon at the enemy, approximately, and open fire. It was about how many shots can we get in the air in a minute. That's about it. And the army that drilled the best could shoot the most rounds in a minute. And that's usually what would happen. The difference between, say, two rounds a minute and three rounds a minute fired. That's usually what would result. However, after that time, something changed in the doctrine and people started thinking more about human psychology. What does a man need to do? Did you know it's kind of tough to get a man to shoot to kill? They have to be trained to do it. It's not natural. In earlier conflicts where people would get up close, you'd find one squad shooting over the heads of the other. Scare them? Yes, absolutely, we can do that. But uh, actually try and kill them, well, that's another story, and we need to educate and drill them on how to do that and get them feeling comfortable with this. There's a YouTuber named Lindy Beige, that's his channel, Lindy and Beige Like the Color, who uh, did a video about this a couple years ago that I really liked. So back to this Taylor guy. Peter Drucker, who's one of these fathers of modern management science, said, Frederick Taylor was the first man in recorded history who deemed work deserving of systematic observation and study. On Taylor's scientific management rests, above all, the tremendous surge of affluence in the last 75 years, which has lifted the working masses in the developed countries well above any level recorded before, even for the well-to-do. Taylor, though the Isaac Newton or perhaps the Archimedes of the science of work laid only first foundations, however, and not much has been added to them since, even though he has been dead all of 60 years. This is quite some time ago that Drucker was saying that. But I think the point is still accurate. What has been done? What did Taylor talk about? He talked about four principles. Take rule of thumb work methods and replace them with methods based on a scientific study of the tasks. Wow, huh? Instead of just doing the things the way we've done them before, that sort of cow path mentality I've talked about, in previous episodes. Let's actually analyze the thing. Second point, scientifically select, train, and develop each employee rather than passively leaving them to train themselves. Again, another duh moment, but I can tell you in my history in the late 90s as a salesperson for an electronics company, I was given the product manual, the price list, a cubicle with a phone and a computer, and hey, have a good time, man. No training at all. Not even a consistent sales process. And these people had three buildings full of employees. It was a bustling business. Somehow they were succeeding on the aggregate, but how much better could they have done if they had followed Taylor's second principle? The third principle of Taylor here is provide detailed instruction 
and supervision of each worker in the performance of that worker's discrete task. I want you to note the word discrete there. That means it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The fourth principle, divide the work nearly equally between managers and workers so that the managers apply scientific management principles to planning the work and the workers actually perform the tasks. That's very interesting. Pretty different. Taylor's always talking about enforced standardizations of methods. You have to have standards. And it's management's responsibility to develop those standards and enforce them. Now, in an era of co-creation, I would suggest that co-creating those standards, at least after a while, once the employee gets some experience, right, with them would be a good idea. So who follows Taylor? There's a couple that follow Taylor. They're named the Gilbreths. And they start their lives, I don't know, around 10, 20 years later than Taylor. They're named the Gilbreths, and the Gilbreths are an interesting couple. The more I dig into them, the more kind of odd they become. I mean, first of all, they had 12 kids, 12 children that lived. Their son, Frank Jr., wrote a book called Cheaper by the Dozen. You may have heard of the movie Cheaper by the Dozen. It stars Steve Martin and bears no resemblance to the book whatsoever. There was also a film in the 40s more based on the book. There's very little that's taken from the original to the 2003 movie. So you get this guy, Frank Gilbreth Sr., and his wife, Lillian Muller Gilbreth. And they're industrial engineers. Lillian was one of the first women to be given a PhD in engineering. That's very cool. And they're efficiency experts who contribute to this study of industrial engineering. And their thing is called motion study. Now Frank serves in the US Army in World War I. Remember the American Army comes in late. They have some things to learn, a lot of piss and vinegar, but things have been going on for several years now. And the French and the English and the Germans are pretty used to what's going on. But that also means that the Americans have the chance to look at things with a fresh point of view. So what Gilbreth is trying to do is find more efficient means of assembling and disassembling pistols, small arms. And he gets this classification system going that says, well, I can do all this hand motion stuff with just 17 basic motions. That's amazing. He takes his last name and flips it around a little bit to call it Thurblegs. <laughs> That's the unit of measurement that he's using, these 17 motions. And he says, there is one best way to do these things, to make these motions. That's very interesting. I'm also extremely cautious of that based on my experience with ideas like AutoCAD. All right, I started learning AutoCAD when I was 18 years old. There's many ways to put something like a circle on the end of a stick. I can use many functions to do that. So here's a guy who's saying, no, there's only one right way. Now we are limited to the human body. What are the Gilbreths adding to Taylor here? Taylor is about time. He wants to take the processing time of things and cut them down, make it shorter, faster, right? The Gilbreths are about reducing the number of motions involved which is an interesting deeper level if you think about it. It's going to cut the time if I can cut the number of motions involved, but there's also something else going on, an ergonomic sense of things here, right? Where if I can reduce the number of motions, the person doing them is going to get tired less quickly. So you need a stopwatch and you need a camera. You can do these today on your own, a time and motion study. So how do you do a time motion study? Well, first of all, you document the standard way of doing things, okay? We're gonna define it, we're gonna write it down, we're gonna film it with a stopwatch. Then we're gonna divide the task into these elements. They could be these Gilbreth, Thurglib motion things. <laughs> it could be something else. And then we time the work elements 
so that we can see, well, how long do these things actually take? That's the filming part with the stopwatch. And then we're going to evaluate the worker who we're watching their pace relative to the standard performance so that we can figure out what's a normal time for doing this. And then we're going to collect all these different people doing the task over and over again and come up with an average that gives us the normalized time. Finally, we're going to apply a coefficient, an allowance to the normal time to give them a little extra <laughs> and get the standard time. And now we're going to have a standard time for this task. Now what goes on with the Gilbreths? I said, if you dig into them, they become more and more interesting. Frank is 55 years old in 1924. He's talking to his wife on a phone in New Jersey at a railway station and drops dead at the age of 55. Lillian goes on to outlive him. She lives till 1972. She lives 93 years. And the genes in this family were pretty good. I don't know how good Frank's were, but Lillian's were definitely very good, and the average age of their kids is pretty long, too. So Lillian has an opportunity for a much longer career. I mean, she practically lives a whole other lifetime beyond Frank. They're writing papers. They're authoring books. And they come up with this methodology called the Gilbreth System, using this slogan, the one best way to do work. Which, again, is a little scary to me, but... I can understand where they're coming from. Lillian eventually gets into government work because she's friends with Herbert Hoover and his wife. She gets involved with the Girl Scouts. And as the Great Depression begins, she's heading the women's section of something called the President's Emergency Committee for Employment, looking to reduce unemployment for women's groups. And she's active all the way through Harry Truman's era and the Korean War. So if you've got people doing tasks over and over again, not one-off things, but something that's repetitive, a time and motion study could be the right thing for you. You can watch some of their original films. They're on YouTube of the Galbraiths and see what they're doing. It's quite interesting. I was watching an episode of James Burke's Connections and that reminded me of the Gilbreths because he mentioned them and he showed a piece of their, their footage. The key takeaway here is to not accept things as the way they are or to think just because you've got maybe even a written down process for something that it is the best way. It's very likely that with the right kind of approach, you can come up with a better solution.